Hello, my name is Yogananda Michael Carroll, and I have been a practitioner and teacher of yoga for over 40 years. As a serious practitioner, I often challenged my teachers in my need to understand thoroughly the history and philosophy of yoga. Much of the instruction in yoga philosophy and history that occurs in modern classes occurs in the form of sound bites that the teacher may present in the opening context or in a meditation. They may show up between uh, postures. These sound bites are adequate for most students who are seeking the physical and mental benefits of yoga, but for someone seeking an authentic and mystical practice, they are not enough. In this video, I'd like to share with you some of what I have learned in my exploration into the history and the origin of yoga. I am often asked by my students exactly how old is yoga? And then next comes the question, what was the original yoga like? Many teachers will tell their students that yoga is five to seven thousand years old. Other teachers will say that yoga is about two thousand years old. Modern scholars such as Mark Singleton have informed us that yoga has changed tremendously through the ages and that it has changed a lot just in the last hundred years. So what exactly was the original yoga like? Sources that say that yoga is five to seven thousand years old are usually based on artifacts from Indus Valley civilization, particularly a small statue of a man seated on a small platform surrounded by a halo of animals. This statue was discovered in the early part of the last century in the excavations of the Indus Valley site Mohenjo-Daro. The archaeologist who made the discovery wrote excitedly that yoga was practiced in this civilization and communicated in this statue. In this statue, he saw a precursor to the Hindu god Shiva in the form of Pashupati, the lord of animals. The Sanskrit word pashu means animal and is a reference to us being bound by desires in very much the same way the cows and horses might be held by bridles or reins. The iconography that the archaeologist saw in the statue that he interpreted as yogic symbolism were the seated posture, an erect phallus, three faces, and a halo of animals, all symbols that were much later associated with the yoga god Shiva. These interpretations have been um, proven to be inaccurate. Scholar David Gordon White um, wrote that the seated position is just a cross-legged seated position. There's nothing particularly yogic about it. And other than Indus Valley seals, there's no representation of a yogi in or anyone in a yoga posture in India for another 2,000 years um, after the seals um, were made. The erect phallus is probably just a waist knot in his loincloth um, tied at uh, below his navel. The three faces is very likely just one face with wavy locks on the side that appear to be two other faces in profile. And the halo of animals these are simply the most powerful animals in India, both in the time of the Indus Valley and in the time when Shiva was associated with strong animals. So, where does yoga come from? The very first use of the word is in an ancient text called the Rig Veda. This is the oldest of the Indian text, and it's attributed to be at least 3,000 years old. The word yoga shows up in the Rig Veda, but it does not refer to postures, meditation, or philosophy. The word yoga, as it appears in the oldest of the Vedas, the Rig Veda, simply means a chariot, a journey, and battle. These uses of the word yoga in the Rig Veda are derived from the word yuj, meaning it to unite or connect. I give you an example. In this verse from the Rig Veda, it's divided into ten chapters or mandalas, 
each chapter is made up of a group of hymns, and the hymns are divided into verses. This is from Mandala 4, hymn 24, verse 4. And as you can see in the Sanskrit transliteration at the top, the word yoga appears, and in the English translation below, that use of the word yoga is the whirl of battle. The word yoga meaning battle here. David Gordon White in his text, Sinister Yogis, has said, in the Vedas, yoga was first and foremost identified with the yoking of draft animals to wheel conveyances, and most particular to the harnessing of war horses to war chariots. The Vedic people were nomadic. They um, raised cows for their livelihood. And being nomadic, having to travel, they often had to cross property belonging to others. They often had to fight for uh, rights to water. So the chariot um, was their defense, it was their protection. And much of the Rig Vedas, much of the, many of the Rig Vedic hymns are about battle and the preparation for battle. Praying for the gods to protect the warriors who will go out to defend uh, the tribe or to access water or passage rights for the tribe. Here's another verse from the Rig Veda. This is from Mandala 1, hymn 56, verse 1. We have in red, Hiranyayam Ratam. Rata was another word that was used for chariot in addition to yoga. So this is a reference to a golden chariot. And the blue, and in the blue, Hariyukam translates as yoked with bay horses. Hari being a color and a horse of that color. So this is a reference to a horse being yoked to a chariot or, or a horse that is yoked um, being a yoga, a chariot. The Vedic culture developed a religion based on nature gods. These were gods associated with the winds, the rains, the, the sun, the seasons. And these gods held responsibility for the order of the universe. A problem was that the gods were not strong enough to maintain that order without the help of mankind. So the Vedic people would perform fire rituals, making offerings into fires. These fire rituals made the gods strong when the gods were strong, they were able to maintain the order of nature. So if the rain god were strong, the rains would come at the right time. They would not be so much that they would cause floods or so little that there would be droughts. If the gods were made strong by the people, the people would prosper and then have more wealth to give to the gods so that the gods would, uh, would be stronger. About the same time that the Vedas were being completed, another group appeared on the scene. Another group holding a different set of ideas. They may have been from the same culture. They are called Shramana in, in the tradition. And the word Shramana literally means strivers. These were people who sat on the outside and saw the Vedic people performing their rituals to honor the gods and make the gods strong. And it seems that these people questioned what is behind the gods. We have a circle here. A cycle where the human beings perform the rituals that make the gods strong, the gods maintain the order and bless the people, and this cycle perpetuates. There's not much in the Veda about the afterlife. These folks begin to wonder what's behind it all. Now the Shramana tradition, the word Shramana literally means stri strivers. The first reference to these strivers is in a later hymn from the Rig Veda, this is the 10th chapter, the 10th mandala, 36th chapter, 2nd verse, and it refers to someone called a kisan. The kisans were silent ones girded with the wind, wearing garments soiled or of yellow hue. Think about your monks later in orange robes. They, following the wind's swift course, go where the gods have not gone before. The describers, it seemed, questioned what most people didn't question. What's behind it all? What is the meaning? What is the purpose? There were many Shramana groups in those days. Only three have survived. Surviving Shramana groups are Buddhism, the Jain religion, and Vedanta, the philosophy based on the teachings of the Upanishads. Now, by the time the Upanishads were written, these were a group of texts um, that describe a philosophy that um, we now know as Vedanta. 
by the time that they were starting to be composed, the Rig Veda and the other Vedas were sacred. And people went back and studied those texts, often looking for hidden meanings, wanting to understand them thoroughly so that they could practice and, and please the gods. They looked very, very closely. And they discovered mystical ideas that they elaborated on, that they wondered about, that they speculated on. And many of these spe speculations show up in the Upanishads. Now, as these folks were drawing from the Vedas and speculating, they brought ideas forward from the Vedas. And one of the ideas that they brought forward was yoga. Now, the Upanishads taught basically that there's a substratum to creation, and that substratum is what we might call pure consciousness. They called it Brahman. But Brahman is masked by something called Maya, and Maya is illusion. The world of constant change is maya. The body and mind with their changes are maya. And maya is the source of all of our suffering. Essentially, the authors of the Upanishads defined maya as that which changes, and Brahman is that which never changes. And they said that most of our pain and suffering comes when we assume that that which changes will not change. I meet someone, I assume they're going to be the, the same way forever. I buy a new car, I assume it's going to be new forever. Whenever I take something that changes and assume that it doesn't, then I create pain and suffering myself for myself. The goal of Vedanta was to see through Maya, to cut through Maya, and find the unchanging self behind. Now these teachers, these practitioners, st studied the Vedas, they looked for hidden, hidden meanings, and then when they wrote, they also used metaphors, just as all spiritual teachers do. And a common metaphor used in the Upanishads, a metaphor for the spiritual journey back to God, for the struggle against Maya, and for the containers, the techniques that convey us or carry us to Brahman, they used the word yoga. So the earliest reference to yoga in the Upanishads is thought to be from the Katha Upanishad, which was written or which was composed around 200 BCE. And the reference says, this, the firm holding back of the senses, is what is called yoga. He must be free from thoughtlessness then, for yoga comes and goes. So the firm holding back of the senses is what is called yoga. Any technique that helps you to do that, any meditation technique, could conceivably be, be called a yoga. The next reference to yoga in the Upanishads is from the Svatashvatara Upanishad. May the sun at the commencement of yoga join our minds and other organs to the Supreme Self so that we may attain the, the knowledge of reality. May he also support the body, the highest material entity, through the powers of the deities who control the senses. The, the commencement of yoga, the starting of our study and our practice of that which will lead us back to the Brahman, to the unchanging self. The Maitri Upanishad uses the word yoga because in this manner he joins the prana, the om, and this universe in his manifold forms or because they join themselves to him, therefore this is called yoga. The oneness of breath, mind, and senses and then the surrendering of, of all concepts is called yoga. And then we have the chariot metaphor. It shows up a couple of times here from the Katha Upanishad. Know the self as a rider in a chariot, and the body as simply the chariot. Know the intellect as the charioteer, and the mind as simply the reins. The senses, they say, are the horses, and since objects are the paths around them. He who is linked to the body, senses, and mind, the wise proclaim as the one who enjoys the Atman. So it's a reference to our whole being as a chariot. And this chariot needs to be guided. If we let these horses, the senses, do whatever they want, they will just go out to graze. They'll just look for what um, attracts them, what appeals to them. We need to take charge of the reins and guide the chariot back to the destination. So throughout the Upanishads, we have reference to the word, we, 
Throughout the Upanishads, we have the word yoga, but not referring to any particular system, referring to any technique or the path itself that leads us back to the soul. Now, all of this changes with the appearance of the very first yoga text, which is the Bhagavad Gita. It was written between the 3rd and 4th century CE. This system, yoga here, is presented as a systematic practice, but it is not clear what yoga actually is. This is illustrated by the great number of compound words in the text that include yoga. Now, Sanskrit, like many languages, has, gives us simple words that we put together to make compounds, compounds that express more complex ideas. We put together the word prana and the word yama to make pranayama. In the Bhagavad Gita, the author is excited, it seems, about yoga, and they present lots of ideas about yoga, but those ideas are not very streamlined, not very mm, put together, not well thought out yet. Compounds containing the word yoga in the Bhagavad Gita. Ananya Yogina, Aishvara Yoga, Atmasam, Atmasama, Atmasam Yama Yoga, Atma Yogi Yoga, At So in the Bhagavad Gita, we have a long list of compounds containing the word yoga, but expressing a great variety of ideas. So Using yoga to mean union or to uniting, we have, for example, Aishvara Yoga, majestic union, majestic union, Atma Samyama Yoga, the union of self-restraint, Atma Yoga, union with the soul, Bhakti Yoga, Bhuti Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, and this is just the beginning. We have a lot more compounds. Now, there are three compounds on this list that you've probably heard before, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. Later, hundreds of years later, when people uh, had developed bhakti yoga, and then they went back and reinterpreted the Bhagavad Gita in light of their time, they created or pulled out these three, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, and pushed all of the rest into the background. So this is what yoga meant in the Bhagavad Gita. Halfway down this list, we have param yoga, supreme yoga, Samatvam Yoga, Indifference Yoga, Sankhya Yoga, Union with Sankhya. At the very top of the list is one of my favorite, Dukkha Sam Yoga Viyogam, the union of the separation with the union of pain. It's a little bit convoluted, but they're exploring. So, lots of references in the Bhagavad Gita to yoga, all as types of union or ways to union or techniques to union. Even more. Now, Patanjali comes along with the Yoga Sutra and gives us a definition of yoga. Wonderful. Finally, we have a definition. Yoga Sutra is thought to be around the uh, 400 to 500 um, CE, a couple of hundred years uh, or 100 years to 200 years after the Bhagavad Gita. Patanjali gives us a definition of yoga. Yoga is stopping the modifications of the mind then the self shines in its own glory. That's great, that's great. Now we have a definition of yoga, but there's a problem. Because as Patanjali is defining yoga, others are doing so, and if you have already done so. This is from the Vishnu Purana. Uh, the, the Puranas were composed starting somewhere around the third century CE, and it's hard to date the Puranas because they were used as religious texts. And every few years, it seems that people would add to them, update them, modify them. So the Vishnu Purana might be from the 3rd century until the 12th, continually being re-edited and adjusted during that time period. But references do go back to um, earlier times, to the 3rd century, for example. Kesidvaja describes the nature of ignorance and the benefits of yoga, how it is performed. The first stage, proficiency and acts of restraint and moral duty. The second, mode of sitting. The third, pranayama. The fourth, pratyahar. The fifth, apprehension of spirit. The sixth, retention of the idea. Meditation on the individual and universal forms of Vishnu. Acquirement of knowledge. Final liberation. So here we have a reference to yoga that parallels Patanjali, even though his enlightenment is identification with the god Vishnu. Uh, the Pashupat Sutra, probably written a couple of hundred years before Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. 
Now I want you to expound the Pashupati Yoga and the rites of Pashupati. Pashupati was that ancient form of the god Shiva, which was assumed to be personified in the Pashupati seal from uh, Mohenjo-daro uh, several thousand years earlier. One should bathe in ashes three times each day. One should lie down in ashes and bathe again. Carry a garland, carry the mark of Shiva, reside in a temple. One should worship with laughter, songs, dance, boisterous noises, salutations, prayers, and offerings. So it seems that here that Pashupati Yoga is to act like Shiva, dress like Shiva, basically pretend you're Shiva with the idea that eventually you will become Shiva. Yajnavalkya Smriti, uh, Yajnavalkya, is considered by some text to be the first yoga teacher, the originator of yoga. Uh, the Yajnavalkya Smriti, the Yajnavalkya Yoga Smriti, uh, involves a dialogue between Gargi, the student, and Yajnavalkya. And here the student asks about yoga, and Yajnavalkya res responds. O Lord, you know the essence of all the branches of learning and are always engaged in work beneficial to all creatures. So I pray to you to duly explicate to me the philosophy of yoga with all its ancillaries. So, teach me yoga. Yajnavalkya replies, O Gargi, foremost among those who have realized Brahman, I am going to tell you the creation of that yoga which was explained by the Lord of Creation Brahma in ancient times. So Yajnavalkya is attributing his yoga to a divine source. Another um, t passage from the Vishnu Purana uh, teaches that yoga was originated by someone named Hiranyagarbha. Now Hiranyagarbha literally means golden womb, and it is sometimes a synonym for the word for Brahman, the, the origin of, of all of creation, but it could also be, and here is presented as uh, the name of a person. His son was Krita, to whom Hiranyagarbha taught the philosophy of yoga, and he compiled 24 samitas or text for the use of the Eastern Brahmins who study the Samaveda. The Shiva Purana gives us yoga as union with Shiva. When all the techniques up to reflection are well exercised, Shiva yoga results gradually. All the ailments of the body are nullified and supreme bliss is realized. Painful indeed is the process, but later on everything becomes auspicious from beginning to end. So a painful process that leads to a blissful um, enlightenment. The Shiva Purana also says that someone can become a god through yoga. Yoga is a way of developing or moving towards um, a deity. A person who has mastered Sutta Yoga becomes certainly a living, liberated soul. A Maha Yogan who performs japas, that's uh, mantra repetitions, and meditations perpetually on Shiva in the form of pranava, that's Om, and maintains mystic trance, that's probably our samadhi, certainly becomes Shiva himself. So yoga is the process of becoming Shiva. The Shiva Purana says that you can become Brahman through yoga. We eulogize thee, the imperishable supreme Brahman, the omniscient, whose features are unmanifest, who can be attained by the yoga of the soul and is, and is complete. So the idea is that yoga is uniting with your soul or becoming your soul, leaving the mind and uh, personality, the externals behind. The Vishnu Purana says that yoga can make us immortal. His son was Maru, who through the power of yoga is still living in the village called Kalapa, and, is a, in, and in a future age will be the restorer of the Kshatriya race in the solar dynasty. So basically he's around, he's been around for a long, long time, and someday he's going to lead this group of people to um, to, to, to restore their, their, their culture from the previous time. The Vayu Purana gives us yoga as a creative force. God Brahma, the creator of the world, the knower of the reality of the world, the knower of the principles who, resorting to yoga, created all living beings, mobile and immobile. The unborn Lord, the creator of everything, the Lord in the form of consciousness and the cosmic witness of the world. So. God Brahma created the world by resorting to yoga. So yoga is now a power. It's a power to change things, to, uh, to manipulate reality. We'll see that again. The Vayu Purana, creation of the universe through yoga. Entering the cosmic egg, that's the primordial universe, the great God caused by
by his supreme yoga, agitation in pradhana and purusha. Pradhana, if you studied um, Sankhya, is the same as Prakriti. The Vayu Purana gives us uh, a teaching that says a yogi can leave his body and enter another's body, pretty far out. By means of this dharna, this concentration, this meditation, he can abandon his body and enter another. He should determine that the sun is the door to yoga. He is called a ditya as he is the recipient of all activities of the senses. A ditya was the, the, basically the, 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 the gods. The yogin who, by this procedure, becomes detached and free from the afflictions of the subtle elements, goes beyond the sphere of prakriti to rudra loka, to the realm of the god rudra, another form of Shiva. The yogin who has attained the status of Ishvara and gunas becomes Brahman himself. So gunas are the, the, the qualities of nature, and um, in Sankhya they're basically momentum, inertia, and balance. And Brahman, the yogi, can become these things. You can become the gunas, the forces that move the universe. You can become Brahman, the substratum behind the creation. The Bhagavate Purana gives us yoga as a way to see through maya, or illusion. Therefore, O God Vishnu, confer on us that yoga which is your natural attribute, whereby we can quickly cut asunder the feelings of identity and mindness felt for the contemptible physical body due to your maya, a bond very difficult to sever. So God Vishnu, confer on us that yoga which is your nature. Now, we're moving into later times. The tantras, uh, most of the tantras were written after the 6th century between the 6th century and the 14th or 15th century, gives us, Yoga Bija Tantra gives us a yoga that will give us an immortal body. The great yogin with his perfect body moves in the world according to his own will. And as this perfect body is produced through the burning away of his physical body through the fire of yoga, there is no further death for him. Sarada Tilakam Tantra, yoga gives us mastery over the elements. Now we declare the meditation on Varuni. Varuni is the god of water, by which one who accomplishes this yoga becomes the ruler of water. Meditating on the circle of water allows a yogi to become wetness himself after only seven days. Further practice brings greater siddhis. So the way I interpret mastery over water is that you could walk down to the river, put your toes in the water, and have your body melt into the water, and then you could re-manifest on the other side and basically by becoming water and then becoming yourself again, you can cross a river. Imagine having that kind of power over all of the five elements. The Lakshmi Tantra personifies Maya as a goddess. As I am all-pervading, I am called Mahamayi. Since I bewitch all, I am called Mohini. I am called Durga as I am difficult to reach and also because I save my devotees. As I connect, link, I am known as Yoga, or yoga maya. As I confer knowledge on men, so I am known as maha yoga. So here, yoga is a form of the goddess, and that form can bless you with wisdom and um, lead you to maha yoga, the great union. The Lakshmi Tantra also tells us that a yogi can dissolve his body into the goddess. Remembering that all fruits derived from the worship of Shakti and all methods of worship belong to its purified form, by constantly practicing yoga, the yogin dissolves his body into me, and thus steeped in me attains my state of existence. Or, seen from another angle, roused by the yogin, I appear before him and fulfill whatever the yogin may long for. So this yoga unites you, brings you to the goddess. In the 10th century, thereabout, a man named Matsyendranatha and his student Garachinatha develop Hatha Yoga. The Hatha Yoga that they develop is based on two forms or two uh, approaches. The first is Hatha Yoga, the yoga of the immortal body, a set of rituals that are supposed to transform the physical body into an immortal body that would allow one to do a perfect practice for an extended period of time, leading to a profound enlightenment and Raja Yoga, the yoga of the soul. And this is essentially the meditation path that we uh, receive from Patanjali and all of these other sources combined into one that teaches a transcendence uh, through meditation, leaving the world, leaving thoughts, leaving the externals behind. 
Hatha Yoga, combine these two. And a few verses from the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the primary text of Hatha Yoga written in around the 14th century, 14th or 15th century. Raja Yoga without Hatha Yoga, or Hatha Yoga without Raja Yoga cannot be accomplished. So the Sadaka, the seeker, should appropriately practice both yogas for the attaining of the Siddha or the mastery of Raja Yoga. Having restrained the prana through the Kevala Kumbhaka, this is breath retention, the yogi should let, the yogi should let his chitta mind roam free. Thus the yogi, through the regular and routine practice of Hatha Yoga, attains Raja Yoga. It's the physical practices, the pranayama, leading to breath retention, that lift us up to the realm where we can properly practice Raja Yoga. So, in summary, there has never been a universally accepted definition of yoga. It has always been an idea or a possibility rather than a thing. Always and forever. Whenever someone was saying yoga is this, there was someone with just as much authority, power, or influence somewhere else in, in, the, in the country of India or in the world today saying that yoga is something else. So yoga is a process. It's an understanding. It's a metaphor. It is a collection of things that lead us from wherever we are back to our soul. I hope this has been helpful. And I hope I haven't um, uh, shot too many uh, sacred cows. Um, I wish you the best of luck in your practice and in your continued growing and understanding of yoga. Jai Bhagwan. Namaste.